Professor Miznam is the director of Bristol Composite Institute, uh, which builds on the previous uh, advanced composite center that they, they established. And uh, it's, it's a center that is growing and uh, there, are, there are lots of academics and researchers working in very close collaboration with uh, National Composite Center. Professor Michael is a world leader in uh, mechanics of fiber reinforced composites and failure mechanism of finite element analysis. And he has published over 400 papers uh, in, in very high quality uh, peer reviewed journals. He's the editor in chief of composite part A. He's a fellow of Royal Academy of Engineering and we are very honored to have him today for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Michael uh, to uh, to start the presentation and introduce himself if needed. Well, thank you very much, Mohammed, and thank you for the invitation to speak at this seminar. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Would have loved to come up to Glasgow, but anyway, it's uh, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about research and the subject this afternoon is about compressive failure, which is something I've been working on. For, for quite a long time and recently we've got some interesting new results and actually we're just about to start a large program grant between Bristol and Imperial College on looking at the whole issue about compressive failure and how we can really make a step change in compressive failure and improvement in the, the behaviour of these materials. So, should have checked that I can get to my slides, shouldn't I? Yeah, I think we can we can see your slides. Just just one I've, comment about the questions is that I uh, can't see my slides. It's not about. Uh, oh, you can. Okay, we can oh, see so yours. I can see the first slide. Did it change? No, it's it's still in your title. Okay, right. Per, perhaps you can just close it and open it again if that doesn't work, or sh or stop the screen, share a screen, and do it again. Okay, yeah, you can do it again, perhaps. We were too confident that everything seemed to be very smooth at the beginning. But, uh... So how about that? Yeah, is, now we have the, it's the not title awesome. screen. Oh, okay, right. Okay, right, yeah. A bit of background then. Compressive strength is a key limitation for many composite structures. Typically, for, for carbon fiber and many other materials, compressive strength is lower than the tensile strength. And for example, open hole compressive strength, and also compressive strength after impact, are key design drivers in many applications. Compressive strength is also important because it underpins crashworthiness. In the crash situation, you're sub subjecting the material to compression, and therefore the basic compressive strength also underpins the crashworthiness performance. One of the problems though is, although it's very important and it's a very basic property, it's actually very difficult to measure. And in fact, there are very many open questions about the compressive strength, how to measure it, and what are the factors which control it. So to illustrate this, I'd like to just show you this round robin study, which was done a long time ago, with seven major aerospace labs around Europe and seven different carbon fiber epoxy materials. And they were all testing these according to their own best methods for measuring compressive strength. And as you see, looking at that data there, there's not really very much that you can conclude other than that there's an awful lot of scatter, about a factor of two variation in the strengths measured from the different labs, the different materials. And I would really challenge anybody to draw any conclusions from that about which material is better than any other material. However, if you replot that data in another way, by lab rather than material, then you see a very different situation. You can see now some very clear trends with some labs performing at a much higher level in terms of the compressive strength measurements than others. And this really illustrates, I think, the difficulties of the testing. And there have been other round robins that have been done since then, using even using the same standard test methods, using specimens prepared by the same organizations to eliminate 
that variability, and they still show a large amount of variability in the results that people measure. So why is this? What, what is the issue? Well, compression testing actually is difficult because you're trying to get the load in, you've got stress concentrations. If you use the typical sort of specimen that we have with a, uh, a tab, let me just pointer up if that works. It seems to be very slow this, I don't know why it's so. Uh... So if you look at the this sort of typical specimen where you have a tab, concentrations at this point. So this is some FE analysis I did years ago, which shows that you've got a high stress concentration at the edge of that tab, where the stress normally 1400 megapascals, it goes up to over 1600 at that point there. But also there's very high shear stresses. And from theories of compressive strength, it's well known that shear stresses interact very strongly with compressive stresses. And therefore you would expect to see a big knockdown where you have high shear stresses as well as the compressive stresses. Consequently, you would expect to get failure at this region here, and that's exactly what you see. So this tends to cause an underestimation of the real compressive strength and also a lot of variability. Now, some people will claim that they get a really consistent gauge section failures, but really you have to ask why. If you, if you get a consistent gauge section failure. Why? When you've got this massive stress concentration, they introduce the load. And normally, it's, in my experience, it's either down to the fact that actually it's controlled by buckling, and it's not really an ultimate strength at all, or it's because there's some sort of defect in the gauge section, which is worse than what is happening at the load introduction point. So there are many factors affecting the results the design of the test rig, the design of the specimens, test procedures, detailed factors about how things are done in the test. So I worked with, with Jürgen Heiberle at Imperial College who developed the Imperial College, which is a slide. Uh, I think somebody needs to mute the mic, I'm getting a bit of feedback. If everybody can mute their mics, that would be good. So Jürgen Heiberle developed the Imperial College test rig and we, we made some beautifully very carefully prepared specimens and took them down to Imperial College. And the first thing he did was he took the specimens and he bent them in his hands to break the bond between the tab and the specimen. And by doing that, he found that the, the strength measured went up appreciably because breaking the, the bond, breaking the bond underneath this tab here, softened the stress concentration and actually increased the measured compressive strength. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about, it's really in two parts. I'm going to talk about flexural tests on unidirectional carbon, because flexural tests are quite attractive for, for many reasons. And, uh, but there are issues about avoiding failure where you load it still, even with a bending test. I'm going to show some results where we scale the specimens to look at the effect of the, the size effect, the effect of the specimen size on the measured strength, and also present a, a test we've done with a sandwich specimen to look at the effect of the stress gradient. And then the second part, I'm gonna talk about hybrid tests. So we've done a lot of work on hybrids, looking at glass carbon hybrids, and it's quite interesting to see whether, what we can learn from testing hybrids. Impression. So in effect, whether what we get when we measure strength in a hybrid is different from what we expect for the individual components. Also, what is the effect of the strain gradient and what the failure mechanisms are. And initially I'm going to talk about M55 high strength, high modulus carbon, but later also show some results on high strength carbon glass hybrids. So that's the outline of what I'm going to cover. So first of all, let's talk about flexural tests. Four point bend tests are a very nice way of testing. It's a very simple test, but normally what will happen is you'll get failure at the loading points. So some tests we did here not very long ago on specimens which are about five millimeters thick with a, a quite a high span to thickness ratio, 32 to one, testing following the ASTM standard and using the loading nose diameter of 10 millimeters as specified in the standard. And we also put rubber pads 
under the loading noses. But these specimens, uh, they did fail in compression, but there was significant variability, and four out of five of the specimens failed at the loading point. So these were tests done by, by Shun Wu, uh, postdoc in, in Bristol. And uh, well, the obvious solution to that is you use a bigger roller diameter. So that's exactly what she did. Used a, a loading nose, actually fixed the nose rather than the roller. The loading nose with a 25 millimeter diameter instead of the 10 millimeters, which was specified in the standard. And 10 specimens all failed in the gauge section with no failures at the loading point. So you can see on this specimen here, that you can see here the imprint from the loading points here, but it's failed right in the middle and a, a clean failure, compressive failure across the middle of the specimen, not influenced by these remaining stress concentrations. And the results show an 18% higher failure strain. So with the baseline test, we got 1.2% failure strain, but with these larger loading noses, it went up to 1.4%. So it makes a significant difference if you can avoid this premature failure. So I suppose in one sense, the good news about all this, this difficulties in compression testing is that when you test and get a value, you're probably underestimating it. So from a point of view of design, I guess that's good because it's gonna to tend to be conservative. But if you're really trying to understand what affects failure, then it makes it very difficult because the scatter and the underestimate and the test may overwhelm any real underlying effects that you're trying to investigate. So in lab tests, we definitely want to try to get a real failure unaffected by other factors which might come into play. So the next thing that Shun did in this project was to scale these tests. So four point Bendy were all scaled up to look at the effect of the volume of the specimen on the strength. And everything was scaled. So the thickness of the specimen was scaled, the spans, the width, and also the diameter of the loading noses. And four sets of tests were done, starting at 2.45 millimeters and going up to nearly 20 millimeters thick. So they're geometrically scaled. So the stress distributions are nominally identical between these different specimens. And according to simple theory, you might expect to get the, the same strength for all of them. But we know we've done lots of work in Bristol on scaling and every test that we've scaled, we've always seen an effect whereby the size of the specimen in some way does affect the strength that we measure. So we weren't expecting the same result. And this is what we got. Hmm, don't know where that green line has come from, but uh, anyway, the blue line there shows the results where going from 2.45 millimeters up to 20 millimeters, then we've seen a reduction from about 1.8% strain down to about 1.3% strain. So quite a significant difference. All these specimens showed similar compressive failures. All of them failed in the gauge section, not at the loading roller. Uh, we did have some ones at five millimeters, which we had to exclude because they're actually from a different batch of material and they showed some anomalies. But you can see that there's a, a large reduction in strain at failure with size. Well, perhaps we should look at it the other way around. There's a large increase because if you look at those 2.45 millimeters, nearly 1.8% strain is very high compared to what typical values are quoted for compressive failure strain, which usually if you look at most materials, oh, some more lines appearing. <laughs> usually, you'll see values around 1%, but actually we've got significantly higher. And part of that is because we've got a better test. We've eliminated some of the premature failures, but part of it may be other reasons associated with the geometry of the specimen. And the key question is, we've got two things we're changing here. We're scaling the specimens, so the stress distributions are normally identical, but we've got a different volume of material. And where failure is controlled by defects, then for larger specimens, you've got a larger chance of finding a, a worse defect, and therefore you might expect lower strength. So that's one reason. So in the big specimens, we've got 512 times the volume that we have on the small ones, and that's likely to precipitate worse defects, which may be controlling the failure. But also, we've got a strain gradient, and work that we did years ago demonstrated that actually 
the strain gradient through the thickness affects the compressive failure. And that's because of stabilization of the most highly stressed fibers by the ones which are less stressed. So we've got two potential reasons for this, which we can't separate in this test. So we can't know, we've got a big effect, but we can't really say what it's due to. So some time ago, we did a, another similar sort of test using a pin-ended buckling rig. And uh, these tests here, we again, we scaled the, the tests, we scaled the whole thing. So in, in this pin-ended buckling rig, we allow it to, the specimen is long enough so it allows to buckle. And then we get a failure predominantly in compression in the gauge section. And at the time, we thought this was a good way of eliminating the effect of the roller. But as you saw in the previous ones, actually, we can eliminate the effect of the roller just by using a, a large roller diameter. But in this case here, you see a similar sort of trend that these specimens going from eight millimeters to one millimeter thick. So the, the eight millimeters, about 1.5% strain, and then they go up to over 2% for the one millimeter thick specimen. So there's a very, very high value. And we concluded from this work, we also tested specimens which were of different sizes, but with the same thickness. And we concluded from this work that it was really the strain gradient, which was the predominant factor which was controlling this. The compressive failure of carbon fiber epoxy is generally agreed to be due to a shear instability. So you have the fibers are at some places slightly misaligned. Under compressive loading, that produces shear stresses and shear strains, which increases the misalignment. And this is a process that can become unstable and lead to a catastrophic instability at a critical compressive stress. When you have a strain gradient, then the most highly stressed fibers on the surface are supported against that instability by the fibers further away from the surface, which are under a, a lower stress. So this previous work had showed that there was a, a strain gradient effect. The size effect tests I've just shown before demonstrated a very strong effect, but we wanted to try to separate it. And the current test methods were not really able to do that. So we came up with this new way of doing it with the sandwich beams. So in this case here, we've got a specimen which is again, the dimensions have changed, but we keep the, the dimension between the, the loading noses the same. We keep the width the same, but we change the thickness of the sandwich specimen in order to change the strain gradient. And we also change the outer span because when we go to a deeper beam, we're going to need a larger bending moment to break it. And therefore, to avoid failure at the lower levels, we need to extend the span so we can use similar forces to create that moment. So this specimen has approximately the same stress volume here. It's got the same thickness, the same length, and the same width. But by varying the depth of that core, we can change the strain gradient. So initially, we tried honeycomb sandwich beams, but we found that with the typical honeycomb sandwich, we got localized roller failure. And so that wasn't what we wanted. We wanted to get a gauge section failure. And another problem was that uh, the core strength was another potential failure. And we need to have a quite a long beam in order to avoid core failure. So that means the scope for scaling the test was reduced. So we came up with this test where we replaced the honeycomb core with a wooden core. Wood is a pretty good material. It's, uh, it's got quite a high strain, and it's, uh, but it's not got a very high modulus. It's very easy to machine. It's got quite a good core strength. And uh, we can make these different depth beams quite readily using a wooden core. So the initial specimens we did were a 0.6 millimeter skins with a 15 millimeter core, bonded using an araldite epoxy, and then tested a relatively long span, but it's manageable in the lab and it worked very well. So this shows results. We had all five specimens we tested, failed in compression in the gauge section with this typical angle fracture that you tend to see with a compressive failure. 
and this is the where it was supported over here so it's a gauge section failure and the good thing about this specimen is we can now vary the depth in order to look at the effect of the strain gradient so we tested a whole series of specimens with different depth cores and this shows the results these are from IM78552 they're actually a different material from the from the previous ones I showed this is a, a typical intermediate modulus and epoxy and we used half a millimeter thick skins and varied the core from six millimeters to 38 millimeters and you can see that for these thicker ones there's not really very much effect but when you get down to these thin ones then there's a significant increase in the failure strain and this 1.36 which is a sort of asymptotal value here that is still significantly higher than any other data I've seen for this material. The highest one I've seen is this work from Oxford where they measured 1.19% strain in direct compression, but we're about 14% higher than that. And we believe that this sort of core depth, then we're not seeing a strain gradient effect. But at this one here, then this increase is due to that, that strain gradient effect. So to put that into context and compare it with other results we've got, then We've put these together with three sets of results. So there's the fully scaled carbon fiber specimens I showed before. They are a different material, but they're still a, a nominally a UD carbon uh, material, similar volume fraction. We've got the, these IM78552, which I just presented, strain gradient results with the different specimens, and then those fully scaled T800924 pin end of buckling tests. And you see they all lie on a similar sort of line here. So just to mention one technicality, we attempted to compensate. So these ones here, these strain gradient results, they've got the same volume of material. These ones, because the specimens are scaled, we do see a different volume of material. So we estimated the variability and came up with a viable modulus of about 40, which the variability is linked to the expected size effect when you go to a bigger specimen. So trying to correct for that effect, we assumed a viable modulus of 40 and we corrected for the volume effect so that these results here nominally are just looking at the strain gradient effect. And what you can see is they're all roughly consistent and they all point to the fact that you see a very substantial strain gradient, but especially when the specimens get very thin. So this specimen was one millimeters and we're up to two millimeters and up to here with with six millimeters. So this is the regime where you see these very substantial strain gradient effects. But once you get to 20 millimeters and above, then these are not really so significant. So some conclusions on this part of the talk. We can suppress the role of failure by using a larger diameter. And that gives rise to, in this case, an 18% increase in the failure strain. The scale tests we did show a strong effect to the specimen size on the failure strain. And the carbon wood sandwich beam successfully enables us to get a, a gauge section failure and to vary the thickness and hence the strain gradient. We see little effect to the strain gradient beyond about 10 millimeters thickness, but this suggests that this beam specimen with a high depth could be used as a really reliable way of measuring the compressive strain. And what we want to do is to use this test in the future to investigate some of the effectors which affect the compressive strength, which have perhaps been a bit difficult to investigate with conventional tests. So that's the first part of my talk. In the second half, I'd like to talk about what happens when we test hybrid composites in compression. So a little bit about hybrid composites, first of all. So if we think about tensile tests, switching gear for a second, just thinking about tensile tests. If you just do an ordinary carbon fiber test in tension, it tends to fail at the ends of the tabs for exactly the same reasons as we saw with the compressive ones. You've got stress concentration, you've got localized uh, stresses at this point here, both through thickness and in plane stresses. It's perhaps not quite so severe as it is with compression specimens because you don't have quite the same interaction between shear stresses and the the fiber direction failure stress, but nevertheless, you expect to get failure at this point here. So in the program that we did in Bristol on hybrids, 
we found that the hybrid specimens can, can eliminate the stress concentration. So we did a lot of work on glass carbon hybrids, and uh, Mohammed is an expert on this. He's done a lot of tests on these uh, glass carbon hybrids. And what happens here is that when you grip it, and you load it, you have a stress concentration, but the stress concentration is largely in the glass. In fact, the stress concentration in the carbon is eliminated altogether. You look at this FE analysis, you see that you've got locally, you've got a stress in the glass, but if you take a section through here, by equilibrium, the total load across that section has to be the same as it is down here. So if you've got a stress concentration in the glass, it actually means that the stress in the carbon is lower. So this is not just a, a, a tabbing effect of protecting the specimen, is actually arranging to have a lower stress locally in the carbon. And therefore, what we find on these tests is it does not fail in the carbon at this point. And what happens when you test it, you load it up, the carbon breaks, you get low drop, and then you can continue loading the drop glass. So you get a very easily recognized sudden load drop, which you can measure the strain at that point. And you can see on this specimen here, it's failed in the middle. And because it's a glass carbon hybrid, when it fails and then it delaminates, then the thing goes opaque and you can actually see the delamination spreading on the specimen. And you can, so you can be sure that it has initiated in the gauge section, not at the grips, and you can measure the strain at which this occurs very accurately. So we found that we would get consistent failure at significantly higher strains. In this case here, you don't actually need to use tabs at all. We found that you could get rid of those tabs and just do a hybrid specimen, put it straight into the grips of the test machine. And for this TR30 carbon epoxy, we measured 1.86% strain compared to a 1.5% using a standard grip specimen like this one here. So the question arises, can we use this sort of approach to look at compression? Can the same sort of approach be used to investigate compression using direct compression tests and using glass, for example, on the surface to eliminate the stress concentration. Before that, we'll just show you these results. These are still tension. And what we see here is that when we vary the thickness of the carbon in the middle, then when these specimens get very thin, when the carbon layer gets very thin, we see a substantial increase in the strain at failure. So these specimens here, these were all made with a very thin ply, 0 0.03 millimeter ply, and here we've got four plies blocked together. So this is about 0.12 millimeters. So this is like a sort of a standard carbon epoxy ply. And you can see that when we go to these ones, 0 0.06, and particularly this one, a single ply, 0 0.03 millimeters thick, we see a substantial increase in failure strain. This goes up to 2.2% strain, which is a very high failure strain for a, a high strength carbon. And work has been done. We did some modeling work on this, and we worked also with uh, with Lerven, with Gentle Swolfs, and he did some modeling. And we showed that this can be explained in terms of in the hybrid specimen, you have a constraint from the surrounding glass informing the critical cluster of broken carbon fibers, which controls the failure. So carbon fiber failure is all controlled by the strength of the fibers. You've got a statistical distribution, and it's a cluster of weak fibers which really controls the failure. And by having very thin plies, you limit the ability to grow a large enough cluster of plies, of fibers, to initiate the tensile failure. So the question arises also, is there a hybrid effect in compression? So let me show you some results which were, were done by uh, Putu Suwata, PhD student who graduated last year from Bristol. And he did these hybrids with high modulus M55 carbon, and S-glass materials. The M55 was a thin ply, only 0 0.03 millimeters thick. The glass was a standard 0.155 millimeters. And the layup was glass alternating with this M55. And we either had a single M55 or double M55 blocked together. And we had 17 repeats of that. So the thickness was slightly different. The ones with the double plies were 3.8. The ones with the single plies were 3.3. And we tested this in this Imperial College fixture, which I mentioned earlier, which Jürgen Heiberle developed, which I think is, is probably the best of the fixtures that you can get for compression, because you've got a joint loading. Some of the load goes in the end of the specimen, where it butts onto the 
place, some of it goes in the tabs used by shear. And the, the trick with this test is to get the thickness of these tabs, just sufficient specimen, they fail from the ends, but if, you, if the specimens are too thick, the stress concentration of the tab becomes too high. So what you want to do is have the tabs just thick enough to suppress failure occurring from here, but not sufficiently high thick uh, stress concentrates. It's quite a good test method. So we tested these specimens in this rig, and these are, so the hybrid specimens tested in direct compression. What you see here is there's a knee point in the stress strain curve. So this was part of the Hyperduct project, which we were working on to try to create composites which fail gradually. And, and we did a lot of work showing that we could attain these nice stress strain responses, which look like a pseudo yielding intention. And this plot shows that we can get the same sort of thing in compression as well. So initially it loads up, when the carbon breaks, we get a reduction in the stiffness. Uh, it's still increasing, but at a lesser rate. And uh, this is a sort of pseudo ductile response. In the terms of what we're looking at in this presentation, we're just interested in the strain at which this failure occurs in the carbon. And you can see that this knee point is at about the same position for both these specimens with the single block of carbon and the double block of carbon. In both cases, they fail at about minus 0.5% strain. And that suggests that there is a significant hybrid effect because here we've got single plies, here we've got double plies. For the tension case, we saw a large increase in strain when we went from double plies to single plies. But in compression, we don't see the same effect. We also did some flexural tests, where in this case here, we've got some M55 in the surface of this beam, which is a glass beam, and we've got two pliers of M55 near the surface. And then these were tested in Ben, where we used to determine the curvature and hence the, the strain on the specimen. And we saw a similar sort of effect. What you get is a change in slope at this point here at about half percent strain. It's a change in slope because at this point here, the carbon fails and you continue loading the glass, but the, now the slope is less because you're just getting the contribution of the glass rather than the carbon. And this strain, about half a percent, is much the same as what we saw in direct compression, whereas the specimens I showed earlier for a specimen which is only increased in strain gradient effect. We also looked at the effect of the layup by comparing specimens with either one or two pliers of M55 sandwiched between the glass. And these were tested in four point blending. And again, the, the knee point strains occurred at more or less the same strain, whether it was a single M55 or double M55. So again, that's confirming that there seems to be no significant hybrid effect no difference between the ones which have only very thin M55 and the ones with more M55 and no strain gradient effect in that these values are similar to the ones we saw in direct compression. So if you look at those summary of those results, then the bending specimens with one or two plies, the asymmetric bending tests with two plies, the, the direct compression with one or two plies, the failure strains within the experimental scatter, they're all the same. And that's indicating that there is, doesn't seem to be a significant hybrid effect in these specimens in compression and really no significant indication of strain gradient effect. So this initially was a bit of a surprise because it wasn't quite what we were expecting, but it seemed to be quite consistent, this story. So that prompts the question, well, what is controlling the failure? What is the failure mechanism? So what was done here, these bending tests were stopped well past this knee point, but well before the final failure when the glass breaks. So at this point here, the carbon has failed, and we can interrupt this test and look at the specimens to see how they've actually failed by doing microscopy. And Butu developed this nice little rig, which enabled him to put the specimen under load and uh, put it in and load it up to see what was happening while it was under the microscope. 
And I hope you can see here what's happening. This is looking at the surface. You see these little cracks. So what happens, these specimens, the glass and carbon, so when they're intact, they're black because the carbon is black. But when the, you get a crack in the carbon, you get a little bit of localized delamination and you see these, these little lines. It's more obvious when you see them in tension, but we see the same thing in compression. If you look here at a higher magnification on the side of the specimen, so this is surface, you've got a surface glass ply, this is the carbon ply here, and you can see these fractures periodically along the length of the specimen. So you can see it's fractured multiple times. And this actually looks very much like a, the corollary of a fragmentation test, where in a tensile fragmentation test, you can load a fiber or apply and get progressive fragmentation. So we're seeing a similar sort of effect. Now, if you consider what happens in a tension test, then there's a critical length required to transfer the load by shear. And that critical length is related to the modulus, the failure strain, and the thickness, and the shear stress which can be carried. And if you do that calculation, you find that for this material here, for these plies, that critical length is about one millimeter. So if we're relying on the shear stresses to introduce enough load to break it, we'd expect those to have a maximum density, a maximum saturated fragmentation spacing of one millimeters. But you can see here, that they're much less than that. Typically they're around half a millimeter. So the fragmentation is occurring at a much, much higher pitch than it would if the load was only being transferred by shear. So what that means is that the carbon is still carrying load. So whilst this is fractured, it's still carrying some load, but still you can go further and get further fragmentations to occur. So this is a little bit puzzling when we first saw this uh, because but, but it is different in compression because in compression, there is butting across that joint. So although it's broken, there's still potentially some load transfer can be had. But then, then the other point is, well, how, does, how can you get displacement? If it's butting up together, then it can't displace. So to show that, you need to look at a little bit higher magnification. What you can see here, this crack, it's approximately, it's about 45 degrees. It's an angled crack. And the critical thing, is what happens at the ends here. So this is unloaded. And then when we load it up in the little jig to 1.2%, you can see we've opened up a delamination here. So what's happened is this is butting up together. And as you compress it, there's some relative motion through the thickness, which starts to open up a little bit of delamination. And this enables a little bit of relative deformation to occur in compression, which gives you an ability to increase the strain while still carrying some load across here. So the stress is not really increasing, but the strain is increasing. So that's what we think is the mechanism for this happening. Look at these slightly higher magnification, you can see here, unloaded, you can see, for example, here, these, this fiber is more or less lines up. It's got a crack across it, but it's more or less in line. If you look over here, you can see it's displaced by about half the fiber diameter because under the compression loading, there's been some relative motion between these, which has allowed that to open up a bit and to produce some strain while still carrying some load across the, that fracture. So this is an interesting failure mechanism, which I haven't seen reported before. I think it's quite interesting. And looking at it schematically, this is what we think, that effectively you're getting some sort of, it's not really sliding, but some sort of relative motion across an angle, crack or it's not a perfect angle like that, but this is just a schematic to explain the mechanism. When you compress this, these move relative to each other and then they force together uh, at the interface here, which gives rise to some localized delamination and allows a variation in the strain. So what this is really all meaning is that the failure is strength control. These are not microbuckle failures. So when I was talking about traditional carbon fiber failures, compressive failure is usually due to shear instability, and that gives rise to a, a kink band. But actually, that's not what we're seeing in this case here. And that's because we're dealing with M55 fibers. So what we did after that was to look at high strength carbon. And in this case, it was T1000 intermediate modulus carbon glass hybrids. So similar sorts of tests in direct compression with these 
blocks of glass and T1000. In this case here, just single plies of thin T1000, and they were testing compression in this rig here. Now in this case here, we did see failure occurring near the grips, but the strains were extremely high. We got up to 2.45% strain, which is very high for a, a, a carbon fiber. So that's roughly double what you might expect. So a very high strain and higher really, I think that's probably the highest I've seen reported for carbon epoxy in a direct compression test. And that perhaps suggests a hybrid effect whereby we're seeing a higher strain to failure in that hybrid than we would see in the carbon on its own. And since that was a grip failure, it might actually be higher than that. So if you think about the, the origins of compression strength, so the classical theories of compression strength suggest that, uh, that actually there should be a hybrid effect. If you consider the Rosen model, which is the, probably the oldest and the, the very simplest of compressive strength models, Rosen model assumes that the compressive strength is equal to the shear modulus of the matrix over one minus the volume fraction. And you see that this equation here does not include the fiber properties because it's assumed that this is a, a matrix dominated effect. It's because it's all about the instability and that's controlled by the shear support from the matrix. So that implies that the strength or the stress at failure should not change with hybridization. However, when we hybridize it, we change the modulus. And therefore, the strain at failure should increase due to the reduced modulus of the hybrid compared to the pure carbon. So what this simple equation suggests is that you would expect a hybrid effect for strain, which would depend on the proportion of glass to carbon. And that seems to be what we're finding with these specimens. But look at that. Putu suggests Putu tested some specimens, similar to the ones I said before, but now they were the high strength TC35, thin ply, either one ply or two plies, and again hybridized with the S glass, tested in bending in this rig here. And what we see is that we've got a, a, an increase in compressive strain. You can set this one here, which is the only a single ply of carbon. It goes to a higher strain before it fails compared to this one here. So we're going from 2.6% to 3% for the single carbon. So that suggests that there is a hybrid effect and that the proportion of carbon to glass is affecting the failure strain that we measure on this test. And we also did some tests using a pin end of buckling, the same specimens with two pliers of, of carbon in this rig. This is perhaps not very clear this picture, but this is a, a buckling rig here where we've got a, a specimen here which is subject to large buckling and it fails in compression in this gauge section here. This was some work done at Honora and we measured the strain with the DIC and this gave rise to strains even higher, 3.5% strain, which I think that's the highest strain that I've ever seen reported for a, for a carbon fiber. So very high strains, and that's suggesting that probably there's a strain gradient effect as well as a hybrid effect. And those two, those two factors coming together are explaining why we get a very significant enhancement for compressive strain. So why is this? Well, this material, the, both this one here, this TC35 high strength, and the intermediate model, this T1000, those both fail by microbuckling and controlled by shear instability. However, the M55, which I talked about earlier, is controlled by fiber failure. So that's actually a different failure mechanism, and the fiber failure is not subject to the same influences as failure which is controlled by instability and a, a microbuckling type failure. So some conclusions from this part of the talk. The M55 fails due to fiber failure, not microbuckling. We see similar failure strains for different layer thicknesses with different ratios of carbon to glass, and there seems to be no hybrid effect. And we also see similar strains in bending and compression, which implies that there's no strain gradient effect. And this is because the failure is controlled by the fibers themselves. It's a fiber failure controlling the overall failure. On the other hand, the high strength carbon epoxy glass shows different trends. We see a high failure strains in bending. We have an increase with a lower ratio of carbon and we seem to see both hybrid and straight effects. 
And this is consistent with shear and stability theory, whereby these types of materials are controlled by the microbuckling type failure, which is an instability rather than a strength driven failure. So there's some references in this presentation, which uh, you're welcome to have. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Michael. A very good presentation. I, I was kind of closely walking with Michael, so I, I, I know perhaps more, more about uh, what Michael presented uh, in details. But if you have any questions, please do ask you. There are, there are a few questions already in the, in the chat box. I'm not sure if you can see that. Yeah, I can see a couple of them, yes. Um... And if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, directly if you have any questions, you know. Well, you're gathering up your courage. Let me see this, this question from uh, Mariana. So, better compression failure between UD and bidirectional. So I think this is a really interesting question, and I don't really have the answer to this. And I think the problem is that with existing standard test methods, it's really quite difficult to, co to compare laminates and UD. So I think we need to do some more tests to understand that. So I would say in the carbon, I wouldn't necessarily expect a big difference between uh, a biaxial and a unidirectional, but I'm speculating here because we haven't really done the test to, to, to say that. But I will tell you something really very interesting that we've noticed with glass and that we found that in, uh, in glass fiber, it seems that in laminates, because the failure strain is very high in the glass, you often get a transverse failure in the other plies before the fiber failure occurs, and this can precipitate the, the failure. So we have seen in glass laminates, we have seen a lower failure strain in the laminates than we see in the UD. But haven't really seen the, that effect in carbon yet, but I think really we haven't done enough tests to, to find out. Um, may I jump in on this question? This is Warren Schijver from Sabix uh, speaking. I was yeah. very interested in, in this talk, a very, very nice talk. Um, we are a member of AVK. Uh, this is a trade organization for, say, uh, thermoplastic composite uh, producers. And we just did, say, a round robin on compression testing. So that, that's uh, okay. uh, quite nice to compare with, with, with you. I hope you did better than the one I showed. Uh, now, this is. I think here's much more information in your work than, than, than what we did because we compared, say, the standard uh, test methods uh, which are, are in use in, at the different, say, companies uh, 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 with mostly, say, the combined shear and loading tapped specimen being given mm -hmm. the best results. You don't need to go to six specimens. Um, uh, but what we also noticed, and that's why I, I just uh, called in, is that uh, say we were looking at say testing of unidirectional uh, materials, mostly high strength uh, materials, not like this high modular stuff. Uh, but then uh, we noticed that especially when you do say a 0 90 uh, layup instead of a pure UD layup, and you just back calculate what would, would be the compressive strength, you get much higher compressive strength than just say, uh, using a uh, unidirectional specimen. And I'm pretty sure that it has to do with this, this stress concentrations uh, at, at the end of, of, of the taps uh, and maybe the stabilizing effect. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable. It was, it was a big effect it was. Uh. Well, so I think that's very interesting. And I think that if you have a, a, a 90 ply on the surface, I don't know which way around you test them, but, but a, a 90 ply on the surface, it's a bit like the the glass carbon hybrid. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, well, that's true. No. So, so I think that could be a good effect. The problem you do have, though, I'd be interested to know whether you compared strains as well as strength, because the problem you do have with hybrid specimens or laminates is if you try to back calculate the, the zero degree strength, is the, the fact that it's quite non linear. So I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compensate with the, uh, with the nonlinear behavior, say, of the 90 ply measured separately. Well, and, and the zero. The zero is also very nonlinear. It's perhaps not widely appreciated how nonlinear the fiber direction response is, but the 
the modulus changes very appreciably up at the by the time you get to the failure strain and you really need to make sure you account for that in making any um, comparisons I have not seen but maybe it's just the materials that we looked at so it's well no all car well if you're doing with carbon yeah say all the carbon fibers that I've uh, ever uh, worked with show substantial nonlinearity and uh, it's not a small effect, and we can see a 50% drop in modulus. Yeah, yeah, I saw it in your, your graphs. I, I saw it, yeah. Um, so, but what would be interesting to do is to compare the strains. I don't know if you measured the strains in the test, but because the strains are reliable, obviously, you, you sometimes you want the strength rather than the strain, yeah. but the strains will not be affected by, by that effect. So, you might see a, a less of a difference in strain. I don't know. It would be interesting to see your results. Yeah, okay, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Good suggestion. Yeah, thanks. So I think there are more questions in the chat box, Michael. Also, please feel free to ask if you have any questions by unmuting Defect yourself. distribution on the fiber. So, uh, no, we have not studied the defect distribution on the fibers. Uh, other people have. There have been some work where people have studied defects along the fibers. And, um, and single fiber test, again, the... the the property data, well, I think this is quite difficult. We've done a lot of work in the past on trying to go from fiber and matrix properties to composite properties, and it's really quite difficult because if you make measurements on single fibers, you get uh, very high results and a lot of distribution because they're very the fiber failure, both in tension, but probably also in compression, much less has been done on compression. There's a lot of distribution in the fiber. And then when you go up to a laminate, the failure is controlled by failure of a number of fibers. So there's been quite a bit of work done on that intention. I don't think really much has been done yet in compression. Not sure that I quite answered that question. So, um, feel free to, to pitch in if I didn't quite get the point. Michael Wu, you have a question? You raised your hand, a few others. Please, please feel free to ask. There is also Chris to raise hand. Bruce, if you have any questions, please do feel free to ask. So I see there's one in here from Tong Ming Yang about improving the compressive strength. So we have a few ideas about this because we're just starting this big grant on looking at this. And I think it's, uh, you can think about this in several ways. So that the really the important thing in controlling compressive strength of traditional carbon fiber composites is all about preventing instability. So it's really down to the matrix, the stiffness and strength of the matrix. So I think approaches which improve matrix, either intrinsically by using different materials or by using fillers or nanotubes or other things like that, has been work which has shown that by putting carbon nanotubes in epoxy, for example, you can improve the compressive strength because you're stiffening the matrix. It's quite interesting to note that modern carbon epoxy materials tend to be not quite so good in compression compared to some of the earlier ones. And part of that is because the matrix has generally been toughened to allow it to, to be more damage tolerant and to have better fracture toughness. But this typically reduces the stiffness and shear strength of the matrix, which has a, a deleterious effect on compression. So that's one aspect. The second aspect clearly is alignment. So the, the, I didn't really mention that, but it's absolutely crucial, the alignment of the fibers. And if you can improve the alignment of the fibers, you can improve the compressive strength. And then the, so the third aspect is, uh, is looking at the architectures. So for example, I've shown here that with hybrids, you can improve the failure strain. So I think that's another interesting line to look at how you might hybridize. And of course, if you can have better carbon fibers themselves, that's the holy grail. If you can actually improve the carbon fiber itself, then you may see some improvements as well. So there's a number of different lines, and we're going to be looking at all of those in this grant, which we've got, which is a five-year program, which is just starting. Great. Um, any, any other questions? Hi, Michael. I've got a quick question. So 
Do you know how close uh, the modelers are to including things like strain gradient effects into strength models? Uh, so we've been using things like Hashin and Laric models in, uh, in Abacus recently, but uh, do they account for these kind of things? And uh, if not, are any models uh, close to development that might be able to do that? So this, I think the short answer is that models such as Hashin or these simple models do not take account for the strain gradient. Mm -hmm. So I think more complicated models can do that. So I did some FE analysis many, many years ago when we were just first observed these effects where I modeled the shear instability by using finite elements, taking account of the waveness and uh, of the misalignment and uh, and the nonlinear shear stress strain response of the materials. And we could predict, well, I wouldn't say predict, we could capture the strain gradient effect in those models qualitatively. But I wouldn't say that we did enough work to actually nail that down quantitatively. So I think there are models which could take that account of, and there's, there's people at the Cambridge, uh, people, Norman Fleck, have done models based on micropolar theory, which can capture some of these strain gradient effects. But I don't think any of these have really been implemented at the level of being able to be applied in, in laminates or structures. Okay. Okay, thanks. This, you're almost uh, like uh, in over, one over, but if you have any, any more questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, just one question from me, and it's more generic. So, what would be, you know, like what would be the effect of increasing the compressive compressive strain to failure, and what would be the you know, the, 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 the the implementations in in long term or in short term, and how how interested the industries are in in these kind of applications? I think industry is very interested in this because. It is a limiting factor on many structures. So I think there's a, we've got very strong industrial interest in, in what we're doing on compression. So I think it's a, a really important way forward. I've just noticed another question which has been picked up here on the, on the chat about the manufacturing method, which is really important. Yeah. Because manufacturing reasons, I guess a lot of it is down to the alignment. So. Uh, Abdul Rahim here has mentioned about protrusion versus autoclave processing. So the highest compressive strength measurement we have measured in a direct compression test came from a protruded rod. So we measured a compressive strength of 2,400 megapascals many years ago on a, a very small diameter protruded rod. And that was, I guess, primarily because in protrusion, you can get a good fiber alignment. The other corollary of that is, there's a big program some years ago the US Navy had on looking at submersible structures. So submersible structures are subject to biaxial compression. So the compression strength of the composite affects how deep you can go or how thick the walls need to be. And when they did the tests, the full scale tests, the results were terrible compared to what they predicted from the coupon tests. And the reason was when they made these large structures with the the materials, they had wrinkles which were not present in their simple coupons. And so that illustrates the importance of making sure that you're represent, you're testing under conditions which are representing the effect, what you're getting in the real structure. I'm not sure I quite answered your question, Mohammed. Was there any other element? No, I mean, that was, that was more about, so which one is more important perhaps? Is it the compression in, uh, that is more important in design or is it the tensile that is important? So what is the basically the high performance applications you are basing their design for? Well, it does depend on the application, of course. So if you look at aircraft structures, then compression is pretty important because compression after impact and hot, wet, notch compression are two of the, the prime design drivers. So that's pretty important. If you look at wind turbines, then compressing is also very important because uh, the compressive strength really is largely the thing that determines the length of the blade you can do. So it's really important for that. And if you look at uh, automotive applications, again, crash worthiness is probably the most important, which also is linked to compression. So I would say it's pretty important. Clearly not in every application, 
but I would say generally it's pretty important and that's why we think it's something which we want to really understand and see how we can improve. Right, thank you. If you, if you have more questions, please feel free to ask. If, if not, uh, I would like to thank Michael for, for the very nice presentation and for the time he, he spent uh, to ac and accepting for our, invita our, our invitation. We're hoping to host Michael in person sometime in the near future, you know, once, once things are back to normal as well. That'll be a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for your great presentation. Thank you.